Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony White, Director of Community and Government Relations here at Family Health Centers of San Diego. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to our second COVID-19 related Spirit of the Barrio and our last of 2020. What a crazy year we've all had. Uh, we're recording today's event and the recording will be made available via our website early next week. We'll send you all an email with the link. So let's get right to it by thanking our amazing family of Spirit of the Barrio sponsors. We encourage you to support each of them and their businesses during these difficult economic times. They're truly com amazing community citizens. First, our Corazon sponsors, Cox Communications, Medical Center Pharmacy, the Port of San Diego, Ranch Rancho Mesa Insurance Services, and U.S. Bank. Next, we have our Adelante sponsors. Adelante sponsors our community health group and Scripps. Now, now our Fiesta Grande sponsors. Our Fiesta Grande sponsors are Aetna Better Health of California, AO Reed and Company, Blue Shield of California Promise Health Plan, Imaging Healthcare Specialists, Kaiser Permanente, Mitsubishi Cement Corporation, Molina Healthcare, San Diego Gas and Electric, Sharp Healthcare, and UC San Diego Health. And our benefactor sponsors, Verona Resort and Casino, Coast Citrus, Edco Disposal, Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest, Shore Office Furnishings, United Healthcare Community Plan, uh, and General Dynamics NASCO. And our patron sponsors, Aztec Fire and Safety, BAE System San Diego Ship Repair, David S. Tam Financial Advisor with Edward Jones, Patterson Palm, Barrett Engineered Pumps, San Diego City Firefighters Local 145, South Coast Copy Systems, and Waxy Sanitary Supply. As I said in September, let me stop this. There we go. As I said in September, it was hard for us to imagine the spirit of the barrio without the usual trappings, the big tent, the networking with colleagues in business associates, and of course the tamales. Well, this time we did our best to remedy the situation by providing tamales to some of you. This morning, we've had a group of volunteers crisscrossing the county to deliver a dozen tamales to each of our sponsors. From Oceanside, to the border at Otay Mesa, we delivered several hundred warm tamales. I hope the lucky ones are able to enjoy them while attending today or over the upcoming holidays. This year, as no, no one needs to tell you, has been quite unusual. When we enlisted our large group of sponsors, we had some great Spirit of the Barrio events lined up. And then COVID-19. We had to cancel our March event at the last minute as the state shut down. And as all of us at Family Health Centers of San Diego scrambled to provide testing and treatment in the first wave of the pandemic here in the United States, we barely had time to do anything else. As we entered our new normal, we realized that we had the ability to provide you with the latest information on the pandemic. We su surveyed you after our September event and almost every one of you said you'd like an update in November. So here we are today. Now the focus of today's event, the COVID-19 pandemic and your questions. With so much information swirling and our knowledge of the disease changing rapidly as new research is undertaken and released, we thought bringing an expert to the table to talk about the pandemic as it stands today in our community would be helpful to you all. Our featured speaker is Dr. Christian Ramers. Dr. Ramers is an internationally recognized infectious disease specialist with over 20 years of experience. We're fortunate enough at Family Health Centers to have him on our staff and he serves as our Chief of Population and Health, Assistant Medical Director for Research and Special Populations, the Director of our Graduate Medical Education Program, and the Medical Director of Family Health Centers of San Diego's own Laura Rodriguez Research Institute. As if that weren't enough, he also serves as a consultant for the CDC, the California Department of Public Health, WebMD, and Medscape. He's an adjunct professor at UCSD and SDSU, an education consultant for the University of New Mexico Project ECHO and the Northwest AIDS Education and Training Center. He also chairs the California chapter of the American Academy of HIV Medicine and continues to influ influence infectious disease policy and practices around the globe as senior clinical advisor 
for the Clinton Health Access Initiative's Global Hepatitis Program. Thank you, Dr. Ramers, for taking a few minutes away from your patients to help us all get smarter. I'll turn it all over to you. Thank you, Anthony. Can you hear me okay? I can. All right, great. I'm going to share my screen here. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and especially to those that came for a second time. I wanted to make this a little bit more interactive, so I'm going to try to stop talking at about 1230. And we've had a number of you already submit questions um, that we'll get to hopefully. I think Anthony will help moderate that. But I did want to start just with a general overview because in this field, things seem to be changing every day, and they certainly are. Um, I'm going to start by just saying that we at Family Health Centers have been busy. Um, we, from the very get-go, you know, took a very strong stance to protect our community and to try to figure out what our role was in this pandemic. And I've listed some of those things here. And um, like I said, it's really taken all hands on deck. Uh, we've had many, many meetings at, at late hours trying to get uh, a handle on this thing. And I think, um, you know, although we're seeing really worse numbers than we've ever seen, um, it, it just feels different. We, we feel like we have all the systems in place and we're really serving the community the way, the way that we know how. I'm gonna start with epidemiology and sort of zoom in from the global picture down into San Diego and some local numbers. Um, here are the Johns Hopkins updates. This is just as of, I think last night I pulled these numbers. So quite updated, almost 60 million people in the world have had, have been diagnosed with COVID, of course, dependent on availability of testing. And I just highlighted in red on the bottom, in the top 10 countries list, a couple of remarkable things. Of course, the US has passed 250,000 deaths, uh, which is quite uh, a milestone. Um, I'm hearing this reported on the news and, I, and I'm happy to hear that, that people are not just spitting out the number, but really stopping to realize that these are people. Um, these are people whose families are now grieving and whose lives were really cut short by this pandemic. So it's really tragic. Um, the other countries highlighted in red have seen really, uh, really impressive surges, especially in Europe, France, Italy, and the UK weren't on this top 10 list as of a couple of weeks ago. And their caseloads have just really shot through the roof. And then Mexico, our neighbor to the south, has passed over a million cases and close to 100,000 deaths. I'm going to walk through very quickly. Um, uh, this map that the New York Times puts out there is just sort of a hot a heat map and the red um, orange scale is really cases in the in the past two weeks by population. So this is from just about, you know, a month ago to show you what's happened in the last month. Uh, this is to the 27th of October and then early November and then here we are uh, almost at this week and they actually had to redo their scale because so many areas were bright red. So they've gone to sort of a map that looks looks more like this. Um, and just to go through the actual numbers in this country in more detail, these curves look very similar to the 1918 influenza pandemic where we had sort of three separate waves. And we've always been afraid of what happens uh, during the winter because pe people tend to be inside sharing a lot more air and respiratory viruses just always get worse in the winter. This is what we see for many, many different viruses, especially in places where it's very cold outside. We're seeing new case numbers that are just quite astonishing and, and frightening that 187,000 cases newly diagnosed uh, just yesterday and uh, almost 2,000 deaths. Um, keep in mind the death numbers tend to lag by about three to four weeks from the case numbers. I'll show you why that is in a little bit, but this is really not a good sign. I mean, we've been worrying for eight months now, uh, but this really has a lot more people worried. Uh, also because, you know, the epidemic or the pandemic started in isolated spots. We had the Northeast, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut that were hardest hit in the beginning. And then we had the Sun Belt, the Arizona and Florida sort of twin outbreaks there. Those have settled down. That was the first wave or the second wave. And now we just have cases everywhere. And the problem with having cases everywhere is that every single case has the potential to cause more cases. And uh, I like the analogy of uh, a wildfire. You have lots of lots of little wildfires really everywhere now. And a single person is likely to pass on to about one uh, or maybe a little more than one person on average. Uh, but what tends to happen more than just every single person passing on are these quote unquote super spreader events or outbreak situations. Um, the trend in all of these three areas is really not in the right direction. And you'll see a lot of curves that I'll show you that look very, very similar in terms of case rates and deaths. This New York Times uh, site actually keeps uh, state by state um, trackers as well. And they used to have sort of an evenly balanced two or three different sections, one where cases are getting higher, one where cases are getting lower. 
and pretty much everywhere in the country is uh, on the way to going up. We just keep waiting to see when this when these curves are going to flatten out. Um, unfortunately, not a lot of people were exposed initially. You know, even in these zero surveys of places that were really hard hit, like New York City, um, antibody levels that were checked in the population of New York only reached about 19 or 20 percent, meaning that after that that terrible first wave, you still had 80 percent of the population that was still vulnerable. So uh, we reached these very very steep what's called exponential spread and um, it just keeps going on like wildfire, which is why preemptive action and, and taking aggressive measures early is really what's important. Just so you know, there are it's not terrible everywhere. It looks like Hawaii is doing a really great job. I think they've had very, very strict policies in terms of testing and quarantining. And then the Northern Mariana Islands um, look pretty good too. So if you're gonna go to a state or US territory, uh, I'd say you book a flight maybe and head to the Northern Mariana Islands right above Guam. Uh, is where those are. Saipan, I think, is the biggest island there. Uh, New York Times is also tracking deaths. And like I said, unfortunately, you know, uh, three to four weeks after these case explosions, we're going to start to see death explosions as well. Probably not as high death rates as we saw in the very beginning, because we are learning how to take care of this disease, um, but really moving in the wrong direction. I had to search, uh, this is the same website showing all the data. The death rate per, per 100,000 population is listed on the right. And you can see the states that really have had the hardest time, New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, all in the Northeast, mostly because of the initial wave. And then you see the Southern states and really all these other states start to show up there. So you see Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, the Dakotas have had very high mortality rates. You can see Arizona and Florida there in the middle, but California has really done relatively well. So we're way down at the bottom here. I had to go down to, this is number 36. So we're 36 in the country in terms of death rate per population. We tend to break all these records in terms of cases and everything, but that's mainly because we have you know, more than 40 million people in our state. So on to California. Um, I'm showing you a lot of information here, but I'll start at the top. Uh, top left is the number of tests being run in the state per day. And it's pretty impressive um, what we've been able to do in terms of increasing test um, capacity. We're up to almost 200,000 tests being run per day. But even with that number, unfortunately, the test positivity rate is really on the upswing. And anything above 5% is really concerning. Uh, that means that we're really um, stretching the system. The new case rates by day, you can see here, are big surge that happened in late July, really as the economy opened up, in many people's opinions, a little bit too fast. And what has the governor making all these proclamations and doing some very drastic things is the steepness of this curve that we're seeing right now. I just pulled these numbers, so this is the latest data we have, but we're really at the highest case counts that we've ever been at. Um, and then as you can see on the bottom right, the, death, the deaths are just starting to curve upwards, but of course we expect that to follow in the next three to four weeks. So just on the bottom here, we're past a million cases, but 13,000 new cases yesterday, that's the highest number that we've really had. That's what has everybody worried. And you can see 93 additional deaths just yesterday. Um, here's another uh, view of it, uh, really with the same looking curves, but I just wanted to walk you through our uh, colored system. If you haven't um, seen this already, uh, we have purple, red, orange, and yellow um, with these sort of uh, restrictions that go along with the different colors. This goes back to October 13th. I'm just going to walk you through what the map of the state looked like uh, week by week. This is October 20th. Not a, not a lot of movement. A couple counties went into the purple. San Diego maintaining that red. Here's November 4th. You know, some places actually going backwards and, and getting a hold on the, the local outbreak. And then as we approach November uh, 10th here, a little more in the purple, that's when San Diego uh, lost our battle to keep our, our rates down. And then this happened where uh, more than 40 counties were moved backward. This is what the governor referred to as pulling the emergency brake, where they, they used the same system, although they basically just uh, tightened up the criteria. So rather than having two bad weeks of numbers, they just took every county that had one bad week of numbers and, uh, and used the same tiering system. But 40 counties moved backwards, including 28 that were moved into the purple tier, which encompasses almost the entire population. So 94% of the state's population. And you probably heard of recent travel uh, advisories that were, that were um, decreed and then a pseudo stay at home order or um, a curfew uh, basically at night that's now been done. And the whole reason that this is happening, if I can just get my pointer here, is um, this. It's the steepness of this curve. This is just very, very scary um, the way this goes because once it gets up there, it really can get out of hand and you can have just exponential spread. 
uh, that can overwhelm our hospital system. Uh, local numbers here from San Diego. Uh, there's a lot of data here, but we were looking at mainly the unadjusted case rate and the adjusted case rate to try to keep this below seven per 100,000 in order to stay in the red. Um, and sorry, let me go forward here. Uh, we didn't do that in early November, and now it's just really gotten out of control. So we're up well above 10 per 100,000, and then our test positivity rate is going up as well. And then our equity measure, which was another thing that was added, is really well off um, uh, from where it was before. So as you probably are aware, we're now in the purple tier, and here's what that means in terms of what can stay open and what can't stay open. And really the places that are outdoor only are the gyms, restaurants, places of worship, and then you have movie theaters and museums there. I'm gonna go through some data to suggest why those four are basically singled out. It's basically because that's where all the infections are happening. I shouldn't say all the infections, that's where the highest likelihood of infections are to happen um, in those areas. Uh, restaurants in particular, because they're places where you just literally have to take your mask off in order to eat. Um, here's a, a lot of data from San Diego as well. I have to say they've done a, a good job of putting the data in, in ways that we want it to, to digest it. The purple line here is the test positivity rate in San Diego now well above 5%. And these little orange bars here, the blue here is the number of tests that are being sent per day. So we're over 10,000 tests that are being done in the county. But these orange bars here, in order to stay back in the red tier, these would have had to stay below 250 or so per day. You can see going back the, the last you know three to four weeks, we haven't been below 250 for a long time. In fact, the last week we've seen the highest case numbers we've ever seen, including on the 14th, over a thousand new cases. Um, because things change so slowly in this disease, really the things that we do today don't show up in the numbers until two weeks from now. This is why the policies have to be so early and so aggressive, uh, because this basically is uh, represents two weeks after what happened in Halloween. I think people probably lost a little bit of their vigilance uh, and had some mingling uh, with other people outside of their households and here we are. Plus the combination of the weather getting colder and people spending more time inside. Like I mentioned, the data has gotten really good. We're now seeing pretty real time data of where in San Diego the outbreaks are happening and the new cases are being um, shown. This is uh, cumulative cases in the left on the green and then just in the last two weeks on the right in the blue, which really gives us an idea of what's going on. You can see, uh, a real hot spot in El Cajon happening in particular. El Cajon, one of the areas that's not really um, following all of the county decrees in terms of uh, keeping restaurants closed. And then some patches that are up in the North County, which we think might represent farm workers or um, essential workers up there in the north of our county. They've also come up with a, a real um, living dashboard that you can go to. Uh, I think the easiest place to find it is just to go to coronavirus-sd.com if you're kind of a data nerd like I am. Um, you can play around with this and it'll give you really granular data looking at all the different places in San Diego. Now, what about our hospitals? Um, people like to say, well, our hospitals aren't overwhelmed, so we should open up even more. And like I said, that's a really dangerous thing to do because hospitals will fill up two to three weeks after any, any policy change that you have. And I, I show you data from regular hospital beds as well as ICU beds, hospital beds on the top, ICU on the bottom. What's happened in the last six weeks or so, you know, we had 200 people in the county um, uh, hospital beds six weeks ago, and we're now almost double that, close to 400, uh, actually close to the peak. In July, the peak was 411 hospital beds occupied. We're only about 20 away from that. And then our ICU admissions are, are rapidly increasing as well. From six weeks ago, there's now twice as many people in the ICU. Now, the county's also made available the contact tracing data to see where people are getting infected um, when our contact tracers call them and ask them. I'm just showing you information for the last two weeks. And a couple of interesting trends here. So the first is 60% of people can actually identify a place where they think they got infected. 40% have no idea. Um, so whether that's from asymptomatic spread or just, you know, they just didn't recall. Um, and then we break things down and we can see the highest number here is either, um, people being infected in their own homes, um, household exposure at 34.3% here or at work. Um, so it really makes us think, you know, are we not protecting our workers, our workplaces actually more dangerous than they need to be? And then when you get into specific workplaces where people that aren't, aren't getting infected as employees, you can see bars and restaurants make up at, 10, at least 10% of the new infections, uh, followed by private group gatherings, which of course are much harder to regulate in a public health way. And then retail shows up here at 8.2% as well. Gyms uh, are a relatively low number in San Diego. Um, there's been some discussion and some argument about that. 
Um, you know, gyms have the option to do outside uh, workouts, which is actually a whole lot safer. Um, one other thing to mention here is international travel. So to, or actually any travel, 20% of uh, people have traveled and uh, potentially exposed themselves elsewhere, 7% uh, uh, visiting Mexico. And then the county also attracts uh, local outbreaks, which is three or more people infected at the same time in the same place. And you can see they're really almost all restaurants and bars, one other business. This has been a trend um, just over the last uh, six months that we've been dealing with this, that restaurants and bars or coffee shops, basically places where you have to take your mask down are really pretty high risk for spreading infection. Just a quick word on influenza. This is data we get from Rady Children's Hospital. Uh, they have the molecular diagnostics lab there. And really the influenza season ended abruptly in April and we really haven't seen much at all. All these blue bars that you're seeing here are uh, COVID-19 positivity that they're seeing. These little green ones here, I think are just a little bit of HRV, which is human rhinovirus, just a cold virus that's starting to trickle in there. And then just a couple of others. And when we look specifically at influenza A and B, almost nothing until just very recently, we're just seeing a couple of uh, cases of influenza. So influenza season is starting now. Um, I definitely would recommend still getting your flu shot because the last thing we need is a bad influenza year in the midst of a bad COVID year. Now, I'm gonna zoom through some of these things, some of the stuff I've covered in the last one, but just to be really redundant about it, I don't know what else I can say about masks. They work um, no matter what type they are, they work a little bit differently from each other. The best situation is when you have, like at the bottom here, both parties wearing masks to both contain the people that may be sick or asymptomatic or transmitting and protecting yourself. CDC, it's not like anything magically changed. They just finally did a full review of the evidence and they now agree that masks work to block um, exhaled virus as well as for personal protection. And they go through a whole list of anecdotal um, uh, accounts here as well as scientific studies that really show close to a 70% reduction in transmission in masks in any situation, whether it be the USS Theodore Roosevelt outbreak or the uh, Missouri hairdresser who had an asymptomatic infection um, and didn't infect anybody because everybody was wearing masks. So just do it. It shouldn't be an argument anymore and it certainly should not be political. Um, a little evidence here showing uh, where infections are occurring. This was a really interesting study using cell phone uh, geospatial tracking data over 10 US cities encompassing 98 million people. Um, and what you see on this, uh, this bar over here on the right is just different points of interest or different locations and where the infections were occurring. And of course you see restaurants are way out here, like four to five times the likelihood of other places in terms of infecting. This is where gyms actually comes right in second place. And it's a little remarkable that in San Diego, we haven't seen as many people um, telling the contact tracers that gyms are there, but also other places where you eat, cafes, snack bars, hotels and motels here. Um, so this is the data that supports uh, the actions that the government is taking. Um, other stuff that was interesting here is that, you know, it doesn't have to be a complete shutdown. So this actually shows, um, it's kind of complicated math here, but the number of infections on the y-axis can be reduced substantially if you reopen but only do partial capacity. So if you go to a 25% capacity, for example, in a restaurant, um, it, is, uh, it is conceivable that you could still have uh, a, quite a big reduction in cases. I think the way things are so widespread right now, they don't want to do that. But for example, if we were in the red zone, a 20, that's where the 25% uh, goes is, is a big decrease in infections. And then very interestingly, this data actually shows partially why we have such racial and ethnic and socioeconomic disparities. So you see in gold and in purple, the top income decile and the bottom income decile from this, uh, this modeling study, and they're using data from Chicago. And what it shows is the people that are poorer as depicted by the purple, are, are less able to restrict their mobility. Uh, you can see this is the percent per capita mobility on the y-axis here. And you can see they're well above where the gold line is. Why is that? Well, that's because people that are low wage workers that have uh, jobs that they can't uh, telework from or telecommute, they have to keep being mobile and have to keep going to work. Um, and so this, I think, partially explains some of the socioeconomic differences that we're seeing in infection rates. Just a little more evidence from the CDC. This is a study of, of actual data of contact tracing people, again, showing restaurants, um, bars, coffee shops, gyms, and um, religious gatherings as the highest uh, risk places in terms of, uh, of, of catching um, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Okay, it looks like I need to speed up a little bit so I can uh, leave a lot of time for questions. I mentioned this before, just so people know the time course of this disease 
is on the order of weeks to months. This is like a, a slow moving car crash, really. There's an incubation period that can be up to two weeks. Uh, it usually takes people three to four days to get a test and then get results and get diagnosed. From that time, there's this very important seven to 10 day period that you heard about a lot when the president was sick where bad stuff can happen. People can decompensate anytime during that time where the lungs go from looking really pristine like this, uh, black like they should be, to being crowded with all of this inflammatory debris over here. And that's what makes people really sick and need oxygen. We think of the disease as two phases. The early phase is the viral phase where your viral load is the highest and you're most infectious at that time. And then even as the virus kind of declines by about seven to 10 days in, the immune system causes a lot of the damage later. And that's why different therapies such as steroids tend to work really later on in disease. It's also, I should note, the reason why we don't use steroids in the beginning. And there should be nobody getting steroids if they're not in the hospital. Um, now, we've added a little bit more to this picture because we're starting to see people on the other side who get out of the hospital. This is a, a study of a survey of people two months after they left the hospital, um, 1,600 people in a lot of hospitals in Michigan. They did a phone survey of all the people that they could find, almost 500 responded. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that are exactly what I'm seeing in clinic. Uh, which is that a third of people still reported symptoms two months after their infection. Now, this is a little skewed towards more severe infection. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. But uh, two months after, that's a really pretty devastating thing. And then 40% of people two months after leaving the hospital still could not return to work. And 48% of people, almost half, reported being emotionally affected by the illness. And only 5% sought mental health care. So a huge gap. Um, in, in what this is doing. We think physiologically this might even affect the brain in certain ways, but also just the suffering and the economic hardship and the isolation that everybody's enduring. We really need to pay attention to this. Um, people often say like, well, why don't we just let any, everybody get infected and then we'll have herd immunity. This is not a disease that you want to get. Um, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's much more uh, confusing. It can cause uh, chronic disease in young people. Um, and it would be much better to get to herd immunity using vaccines, which I'll get to in a little bit. Really quickly on diagnostic testing, I think everybody kind of gets the idea now that there's diagnostic tests that are virologic. Uh, over here on the left, there's a pretty narrow window of when they're going to catch a positive result, actually. And it's not good enough just to do it once. You have to do them repeatedly if you're repeatedly exposed. And then there's these serologic tests over on the right, which really should tell if somebody has developed those little Y-shaped molecules called antibodies. Um, and that really doesn't turn positive until about two weeks after you've started having, having symptoms. We would prefer to send it on you about a month after to see if you've developed an antibody. Um, we've been very successful in, in doing a lot of uh, testing and increasing our capacity. It's a, an amazing team in our lab that's been able to do that. This FQHC clinic is us, Family Health Centers, and you can see our turnaround is actually better than anywhere else in the county. I hope we can maintain that as our volumes uh, tick up quite a bit. Um, speaking of volumes, this is what we've been seeing in the last uh, two months or so, the, the green line here are the number of tests that we're sending per day. We obviously don't send them on weekends, but we've gone from about 150 tests a day all the way up to 300, which is close to the highest we've had. And then the red line on the bottom here is the number of positive cases. So we, we used to be diagnosing 10 to 20 per day, and we hit, I think, our record 63 new positive diagnoses on Tuesday of this week. And the percentage positive that you're seeing is in the bar graphs in blue and red here. Um, through the pandemic here, we hit a peak in July with 14% positive uh, out of the ones we're sending, a much higher positivity than you saw on the county's overall rate, probably because of the communities that we serve, especially in the South Bay. Uh, but in November thus far, 17.7% positive rate, which is extremely high. And we've diagnosed uh, over 4,300 cases of COVID in our patients. Uh, speaking of testing, we did deploy our testing apparatus to help the, uh, the homeless outreach that was happening where people were being put in the, the San Diego Convention Center. We took a strategy of testing uh, early and aggressively asymptomatic individuals to identify those and get them out and, and put them in hotel rooms to keep them from spreading. You can see the data here. Overall, with this approach, we had a very nice low 0.9% positivity rate and really prevented outbreaks in our homeless populations. And I'm happy to report that we had a graduate student, Hannah Marquez from San Diego State School of Public Health working on this with us. And she's gotten a manuscript published uh, in a really good journal, my favorite journal, but I'm a little biased, Clinical Infectious Diseases, um, just last month. Um, in terms of antibody testing, we are offering antibody tests. Um, it's a useful thing to do if you think you've been exposed. 
we ask our clinicians to sort of make a guess of whether we think someone's going to be positive or not based on what we call a pretest probability. And high pretest probability is those that people have, who have a diagnosed infection who have had a positive COVID test. It's interesting, only 91% of people will have a positive antibody. What does that mean? It means either we're checking too early or um, not everybody develops an antibody, um, which is interesting to think about later. I think we're gonna get some questions about reinfection. All right, I'm gonna finish up. I'm already over 1230, I broke my own promise, but I know you wanna hear about vaccines. Um, I like this cover from The Economist. It's the light at the end of the tunnel and it's a vaccine there. Um, we are um, very happy to see these results. I, it bothers me a little bit that we don't have the full data to look at. We just have these press releases but suffice to say, the press releases are pretty impressive. So 94 and a half or 95% effective, the first two out of the gate. I want everybody to get a realistic sense of timeline here. Um, the FDA is going to meet probably over the next couple of weeks and likely give emergency use authorization to one or both of these vaccines. And then the process begins to start implementation and to distribute them. Um, the vaccines are going to go first to the highest risk individuals, which include healthcare workers like myself, as well as uh, people uh, that are over age 65 and with underlying conditions. And this is gonna be one of the biggest logistical challenges we've ever undertaken. Um, so don't expect this to happen for the general population anytime soon. I think we're looking at April uh, is really what the best estimates are. I'm extremely proud of the work that we've been doing in continuing to increase community outreach and community awareness. Um, we've partnered with UCSD and the Coronavirus Prevention Network and the websites are there. Uh, to continue to enroll people in additional vaccine trials. You've heard all the news about Moderna and Pfizer, but there's actually four other major vaccine candidates, two which are in clinical trials right now, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and the Janssen vaccine. Um, these, we need to get these vaccine trials enrolled. We need as many vaccines as we can get. And like I said, you're not gonna get it anytime soon unless you're in a special group. Um, this registry has over 2000 people that have, that have sort of signed up and raised their hand and said they wanna do it. Um, and then they're just actually starting now to enroll uh, a little bit over 100 in the trials so far. And we've also developed a lot of community education and outreach in our own website uh, with our team, Liz Flores and Carolina uh, Carillo, who are out there in the community talking to people at our testing sites. And we have lots of good information in English and Spanish to answer everybody's questions there. And then I felt like I had to disclose, uh, I enrolled in one of these vaccine trials myself. Um, I, I really, everyone says, well, why did you do that? You're, you're going to be the first in line once we get these vaccines in January. But I wanted to address a couple things. The first is that there's a lot of fear in communities of color, uh, understandably. It's not unfounded fear. It's fear because of past inequities and in things like the Tuskegee experiments and things like Henrietta Lacks and all these things where there's been really uh, bad abuses by researchers in the past. And taking that fear and trying to turn it into hope that we're really close and we're at the, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel is really something I wanted to do. So I also live by the, you know, Gandhi's uh, be the change you wish to see in the world. If you want something done, do it yourself. And that actions speak louder than words. So here's the, one of the trailers, which is in National City where the Coronavirus Prevention Network is enrolling people. Um, it's a pretty easy process. It takes about two hours. It's a very long, extended, very detailed medical visit. And then they bring in a magical red cooler, which either has placebo or a vaccine in it. Um, you probably won't have camera crews with you. I just brought those guys along to sort of document uh, what was going on. Um, and another reason why I did this is that these, the phase one and phase two data on all of these candidates is incredibly positive and very safe. There's really nothing that, that jumps out in terms of a really bad um, side effect. Also, I believe the, the timing is critical here. We need to get this done in, the, in a window that's rapidly closing um, to have the most candidates that we can have possible. So I'll finish with just these two uh, blockbuster pieces of news about Pfizer and about Moderna. We don't know the complete details, but here's what we know so far. Pfizer, they stopped the analysis, the final analysis, after 170 cases of COVID happened out of almost 44,000 people. 162 of those cases occurred in the placebo group and only eight occurred in the vaccine group. And you do all the math and that's a 95% efficacy. In addition, they said they looked at severe cases of COVID, not just mild to moderate cases, but nine of those occurred in the placebo and only one in the vaccine group. And thus far, all we have is a very early readout of adverse events with three and a half or 3.7% with fatigue and 2% with headache. 
Now, implementation, what does this look like going, going forward? They're going to make 50 million doses by the end of the year. This is why this is happening so fast, is they're making them now. Usually, a company waits until approval to make them, but they're being made right now. 25 million of those are for us, 25 million are for the rest of the world, and it's a two-dose uh, two vaccine, so that means 12 and a half million people will be ready to be vaccinated quite soon. Uh, we're looking at end of December and early January. Moderna also reported very excellent efficacy here. We have limited information here, but 95 cases were reported. I'm pretty sure this is still an interim analysis, um, but 90 cases occurred in the placebo group and five in the vaccine group. They also reported some pretty encouraging news about transport, whereas the Pfizer vaccine has to be uh, kept in this ultra cold chain of minus 70 degrees Celsius, where we'd have to just completely you know, find new freezers. Um, most doctor's offices don't go down to minus 70. The Moderna vaccine actually looks like it has a 30-day shelf life at a normal refrigeration uh, number, and then it has a 12-hour room temperature uh, shelf life, which is really encouraging. Um, I, I just want to emphasize, we're not done. These are the, the first two out of the gate. These are a new technology that we're really not used to working with, this mRNA. Um, so there's other, um, other platforms here. The AstraZeneca and Janssen trials are currently in phase three and ongoing right now. And then there's two more even, the Novavax and the Sanofi Pasteur, which are um, coming down the pike a little bit uh, later on. I think I'll just basically skip through therapeutics. There's been one um, uh, approved medicine that's an antiviral called remdesivir, which is still available and being used. There's a steroid that I have a red line here because we really shouldn't be giving it early. It's only for late in the disease course. And then of course we do good supportive care and things like convalescent plasma. And there was one of these monoclonal antibodies, bamlanivimab, which was uh, given emergency use authorization. It's an IV infusion that's designed to be given outside of the hospital. So working on the logistics of that are really quite tough, but I do know that San Diego is going to be getting doses shipped soon. Interestingly, it showed that it could reduce the hospitalization risk of high-risk patients from 10% down to about 2 to 3%. Um, but the thing is, you really have to give it to a very select high-risk patient group. And so there's all these stipulations that you really have to have one of these conditions and be within 10 days of your diagnosis to qualify for this. And we're working out these things with the county of who gets this and where. So I'm at the end here. I just want to finish with this picture showing that it's not any one single thing that's going to get us through this. It's the distancing, the ventilation, not being in indoors with crowded uh, uh, stale air. It's wearing masks, it's washing your hands. It's a lot of testing and tracing. And then what's not on here is the vaccine, which is really gonna be the best way out uh, of this pandemic. So I will stop and Anthony, hopefully you can help me with uh, some of our questions. Great. Yeah, we have uh, questions that people sent in when they register. Um, so we've grouped them in kind of areas we have one section on reinfection and immunity. So um, someone by the interesting name of Robert Ramers sent this question. Um, <laughs> any update on the impact of having a mild case on the possibility of or severity of a second infection? All right, yeah, that's my father. So um, <laughs> hi, Dad, I hope you're doing okay. And there's a couple others in here maybe in the same answer as uh, can, you get, uh, can you get COVID twice? Yeah. Okay, so let me share a couple of slides because I think actually they're, they're going to be instructive here. Um, so the short answer is yes, you can get COVID twice, um, but it's extremely rare. So excuse the Spanish here. I just put this together for a, a, a presentation in Mexico, but the usual thing that we expect to have happen here is that a normal person will be exposed and develop a nice B cell response and a nice T cell response. The B cells are what produce these things called IgG or antibodies. And those are going to surge for a while and then sort of go down a little bit. But we should have this ability to protect if you get re-exposed. That's called an anamnestic response. The problem is that when we look for these antibodies, number one, not all of them are really good antibodies. Not all of them are what's called neutralizing antibodies. This particular study that I'm going to show you um, looked at 44 people uh, that were infected with COVID and four of them didn't develop any neutralizing antibodies. So that looks like about 10% of people are just somehow not going to develop an antibody. I showed you our data from family health centers where 10% or 9% of our patients don't develop a strong antibody after they've been exposed. Um, so that's unfortunate, but you know, people are all different. They all have different genes, different immune systems, and not everybody's gonna be fully protected um, after they get infected. A little bit more um, detail to that situation was given by this particular study by some investigators in Seattle 
And what they do is they show that um, approximately 30, 60, and 90 days after being exposed, this is looking at neutralizing antibodies themselves, and they look like they tend to fade a little bit with time. That might not be that much of a problem because they might have uh, cells that can make more antibodies if they are to get re-exposed. But interestingly, over on the right-hand side, the question I think from my dad was, if you have a mild infection, does that have any uh, bearing on this? And the answer is yes. The asymptomatic patients here were in blue and they started out with low levels and they went even lower going forward. And those that had more severe disease in the yellow actually had much higher levels of antibody. So it looks like a couple of things are true. Number one, not everybody develops an antibody. And number two, the sicker you get, the more likely you are to develop an antibody. Now, a big uh, unknown question is how the vaccine relates to that. We really just don't know. And we also just don't know the duration of protection. So it could be that, um, that you get out to six months or maybe 12 months and that the antibody levels are so low they don't really work anymore. That's kind of what it looks like with other coronaviruses that cause common colds. Uh, finally, I should say that there have been several cases documented in the literature that are absolutely positively 100% reinfections. There's a lot of dispute about this because some people can have these, these lingering positive uh, PCR tests detecting tiny, tiny little bits of virus, but it's not truly a reinfection. Uh, but there have been some cases reported in the literature. This particular one is a guy from Hong Kong who had uh, two separate viruses that were genetically analyzed and from totally different families uh, between his first and his second infection. And they were, I think, 150 days apart from each other. So reinfection does occur. We have seen actually two cases that we think are, I've seen them myself, two cases that I think are reinfection in our own population. It's difficult to prove because we don't have this, this level of genetic sequencing and everything, uh, but it actually does occur. So to answer, that's a long answer to the question, but the answer is yes, you can get reinfected. Not very likely because we've had now almost 60 million cases in the world and very few reported reinfections, uh, but nothing in life is 100%. Anthony, you want to come back with another question? <laughs> Sorry, I muted. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a Zoom call without that, right? Mm -hmm. um, Mary Plummer from KPBS mm -hmm. iNews Source asks, "Can you talk about whether San Diego County faces any any unique challenges compared to other places when looking at the next month or two? Interesting question. So I I, I think we are a unique place uh, for many reasons, and it has a lot to do with us being a border town. So. Um, I don't have the numbers off the tip of my tongue, but there are a, uh, a large number, I think it's in the thousands, almost hundreds of thousands, you may know, Anthony, of people that are actually U.S. citizens or permanent residents that live across the border in Tijuana and cross for work. Um, so that's a unique challenge, I think, basically having to, you know, coexist with a, with a different country right next to us. Um, that is one thing that really is, is important for us. Um, I also think that we have a, a pretty um, geographically uh, disparate um, socioeconomic landscape in our county, where the further north you go, uh, the, the further uh, things change from a socioeconomic status uh, standpoint. So those, I think, are our unique challenges. I think we have a lot of strengths as well. We have an incredible university and a medical school. And really, access, I wanted to highlight this a lot. Um, regarding the ability to participate in vaccine trials. I, I, I get on these echo sessions and I'm Zooming with people all over the country and a lot of people don't have access to this type of clinical trial research. So, you know, we have the potential for everybody in the community to participate in these trials because we have the investigators here and because we have such expertise. Great. We have a section on um, transition, uh, sorry, transmission and masking. Uh, Dennis Dubard, our friend from General Dynamics NASCO, says, given the significant rise in positive cases in San Diego over the past weekend, what are your thoughts and what is causing this spike? Are people not following? And then Zach Schlegel from PATH said, what recommendations do you have for interacting with family members over the holidays? Yeah, those are two great questions. Um, I have my guesses about what's happening in San Diego, and looks like I didn't include the, um, oh, I did, okay. Uh, the travel issue that's kind of a separate so the first is um you know i think people generally are wearing masks appropriately at least they are in my neighborhood i know there's there's different places um throughout the county and people have different adherence to the mask guidelines the trouble is you kind of have to be close to perfect here uh, because this is an airborne virus um, and uh, that mask that seeps down over your nose and doesn't protect your nose it just doesn't work 
Um, you know, I, as an in infectious disease specialist, am very comfortable and trained with how to wear PPE, and it thus far has protected me very, very well, uh, despite some very high-level exposures. But the general population doesn't really get training in how to wear masks and everything. And there's a lot of uh, touching the face, touching the mask. Um, and so masks aren't perfect, but they are definitely our best hope. Um, part of it, I think, is mask use. Part of it, I think, is fatigue. I think people just really want to see each other. My, my wife was actually, she doesn't mind me sharing, crying last night about uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, which I'll get to in a second, because it's just, we are a social uh, animal. We want to see each other. We want to hug each other and touch each other and eat together. And that's very, very difficult. I think people are just getting fatigued from that. Um, the, the latest bump in cases may be related to Halloween as a perfect example of that, that it's just hard to tell your children, no, you can't have Halloween. The other thing which has just um, been well known, and I, I added to this, or I alluded to this before, is that when it gets colder, people just spend more time inside. And we know that indoor environments are just much more dangerous in terms of sharing an airborne virus like this. Now, with respect to the second question on holidays, so this is a hot topic right now. And really just within the last week, I've, I've been bringing it up on the county public health calls that we have, you know, we need some guidance, we need, people are gonna start thinking about making their plans. Um, and just in the last, I'd say, 48 hours, there have been a slew of recommendations, partially because of the incredible surge that we're seeing in cases. Uh, on the top left is the county's Thanksgiving guidance, the top right, the county's winter holiday guidance, the bottom left is the state that put out a, a travel, uh, non-essential travel advisory, and then the bottom right is the CDC. Essentially, everybody's saying, option number one, best thing to do, don't travel. And it's really a basic concept here, which is that you know we're already seeing cases surge the way they are with, with people trying to stay home as much as they can. When you take all these households that have been separate from each other and just mix them all together, that is essentially how this virus travels. So um, it really could have a major impact on new cases um, to have uh, different households eating together, especially if they're eating with their, with their masks off and everything. Um, the bottom left, I'll, I'll mention that anybody that travels outside of California really should self-quarantine for 14 days on their way back in. Um, now, I understand that people may choose uh, to see their loved ones. Maybe they're uh, suffering from a, a chronic illness and it might be the last time they get to see them. And there is a desire to have some advice of what to do if I choose to break the order and travel. Well, if you work for family health centers, you're going to have to either quarantine or um, check in with our occupational health twice a day for 14 days. Um, I think testing is probably a really good, but not foolproof uh, thing to do if you're going to visit people. Now, what do I mean by that? You definitely need to test before you leave, but then any, any way that you travel, whether it's in a car with people or in the airport, um, you're, you're doing a new exposure. And so that negative test that you had yesterday or last week doesn't tell you anything about your risk going forward. Um, so if I were to do this and, I, and it was a, you know, people just had to get together. I'd say everybody in the family needs to test probably four to five days before you leave so that you can get the results back. And then everybody should probably test once they get there too, because you've just had another big exposure. Of course, that gets complicated and the risk is not zero. So the best thing to do that everybody here is, is saying to do is to stay at home and, um, and not do the travel. So that's the bad news. <laughs> um, We'll go into a little section on maybe good news, vaccines. There's lots of questions on vaccines. I'll read just a couple of these and then you can weigh in. Um, Claudia Rempel says, if the vaccine trials are found to be effective, how long will it take to have them accessible to the community and will there be a high cost? Um, Julie Pickerel says, how confident are you as a medical professional in the effectiveness rates of these vaccines? Uh, Patricia Alvarez says, uh, usually it takes four years to develop a vaccine. Uh, and why do you think the development of this is taking so much less time? Okay, so let me get to those one by one. Uh, let's see, the first one was about effectiveness and how long. So let me show a slide here. Um, this is going to be, like I said, one of the biggest uh, implementation and logistics problems that we've ever dealt with. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion of who gets it first. Um, if you just let the market decide, rich people get it first. And we all know quite well that rich people are not the most at risk or affected. So the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine had a very nice um, online open public forum. This is like science um, and ethics at its best. They had um, public comment, a five hour open thing. I actually got to make a public comment um, and they came up with, and they also reviewed 
all history and all you know vaccine campaigns in the past and came up with this four phase implementation response where uh, we have uh, phases that are dictated by either the risk of dying from the disease or the risk of catching the disease. So right at phase one, you have the jumpstart phase where healthcare workers, first responders will get it. And then phase one B, people with comorbid and underlying conditions that put them at significantly higher risk. And then finally, older adults living in skilled nursing facilities. Um, this is gonna probably exhaust the initial supply of vaccines, to be honest. So the early Pfizer, the early Moderna doses, that's all gonna be taken up by phase one, which is why we've been saying all along, don't expect to get a vaccine unless you fit into one of these categories until we get into phase two or phase three, and that's gonna be well into next year. As you can see, phase two uh, involves um, uh, essential workers, including uh, school teachers, and then people in high risk outbreak settings like homeless shelters, prisons, jails, that kind of thing. And then we get into phase three and we get to more of the general population, including young adults and children, people in other essential work occupations, and then phase four is everybody. Um, so I can't predict the future, but I know that the planning is happening now. Um, as soon as emergency use authorization occurs, I know that Pfizer is gonna begin shipping, I think within a week or so, uh, with these ultra cold freezer and freezer pack devices. Uh, it's gonna go to the states. The state's already developing a plan. The county is already developing an implementation plan as well. And a really important element of this is that across all of these phases, we have to consider equity as a cross-cutting consideration, as you see on the bottom. Uh, it's been suggested that we use something called the Social Vulnerability Index, which in San Diego, you can see there, this is basically, it tracks exactly for where COVID is being um, uh, experienced the most because it has to do with socioeconomic status. Uh, and so in Central, at San Diego, in El Cajon, and down towards the border, those will be the places that we probably direct the vaccine to do it in an equitable way. Um, and I hope you hear me saying that that's going to be months from now. Second question that came through uh, was from Julie, how confident about the efficacy? So um, I am not all that confident uh, that it's going to be exactly 95% when all the numbers come out there. This is why it irritates me a little bit that we don't see the actual data and we just see press releases. I am very encouraged by the FDA, which said last week that they are going to have full transparency when they have their hearing. Um, so that should come over the next week. And of course, I'm going to be watching that um, as closely as I can. That'll show the actual efficacy in the subgroups. We'll see if it's protecting from severe disease or mild disease. Um, but I don't think they would report a 95% number if that wasn't really, really good. And remember that the, the FDA really just wanted these vaccines to be at least 50% effective in order for them to, uh, to be approved. Um, and then finally, uh, what about the speed? So that's a really good, uh, good question. The reason things have happened so fast is because many processes that usually happen in um, series where you have to do a whole phase one and then a whole phase two and then a whole phase three trial and then you have to apply for FDA approval and then you have to wait to produce the vaccine. All those things are happening at once. And normally that wouldn't happen because it costs billions of dollars to do that. And that's the beauty of Operation Warp Speed is that it's basically pumped in money into these companies so they have no financial risk of just making the vaccines. They're already making millions of doses of the vaccine even before approval. So that's why it's happened so quickly. I don't think any corners have been cut. We have still had phase one, phase two, and phase three trials conducted. Um, and so it's all the same process. It's just a little bit compressed and things happening in, in parallel instead of in series. Um, obviously, we need to watch what happens after this vaccine is approved. And the CDC has already started some very robust post-approval marketing strategies, including a text messaging system where everybody that gets the vaccine is going to get a text from the CDC uh, to be able to report any adverse events that were picked up in the trials. And then finally, I think Mona asked a question about why would you enroll in trials now? Well, I've gone through some of that with my own sort of story. Uh, it's a limited window to get these last four vaccines um, to get the data we need. Uh, the, the vaccines are going to come up against a really tough ethical problem where you can't really run a placebo controlled trial when there's an emergency vaccine that's approved. You know, me as a healthcare worker, I would be first in line here. Um, and if I'm in the placebo group, they just can't do that. So they're working on ways to do innovative crossover designs where everybody in the trial gets the opposite arm intervention so that you know that may be a solution. Um, but really what we have to do is enroll these trials very, very quickly. And as I mentioned, we can't just like stop with the first one that wins the race, whether it be Pfizer or Moderna and jeopardize the entire rest of the operation. We really need to go all the way through. 
And like I said, there's plenty of time to do that because it's gonna be months before the general population can get vaccinated. Also a statement by the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics saying, now is the time to start uh, vaccinating children. It's not, really, um, it's not really fair that we haven't really done any um, children's uh, studies. I think the Pfizer one went down to age 12, but nothing below that. And so I think the manufacturers are gonna start responding to that as well. Great. Further questions? Yeah, now, so now we have some questions on testing. Uh, Suzanne Pomeroy from Kaiser Permanente, please discuss testing pros and cons, mostly the antibody testing, but also for the presence of active virus. Um, and David, David Mann asked a similar question, is the rapid test just as good as the 48 hour test? So tell Great. us about testing. Yes, yeah, so I don't think there's been a clear message to the public about this um, because of the initial lack of availability of testing. And it was really tough to watch our public health officials say, you don't need a test if you're mildly ill, because testing is really the key to contact tracing and to prevention of more, more infections. We now, like I said, are running 10,000 tests a day in San Diego. There should be plenty of tests for everybody. So who should get tested? Definitely, if you have symptoms, you have to get tested. Definitely, if you've been exposed to somebody that's a confirmed case, you should get tested. And the county has advised that the ideal time to do that test is gonna be about five days after the exposure. If you're okay doing multiple tests, I would do one right away and then maybe five days after, and then perhaps one at the end of the incubation period to be extra sure, that's 14 days. Um, uh, the tests, uh, the more you can do them, the better. And then there's also a recommendation if you're in a high risk occupation to just test periodically anyway. We don't really know the ideal uh, periodicity of that, but it seems like every two weeks is a reasonable thing to do if you're an essential worker and you're exposed to a lot of people in the public. Um, we're on the verge of having an additional a test widely available, which is called the antigen test. There are some advantages and some disadvantages to antigens compared to the regular standard PCR. We're gonna still need the PCR. That's the one that goes up the nose and, and goes to a lab and gets you results within 48 hours usually. A lot of the antigen tests can give you results within 15 to 30 minutes. So that's obviously a huge advantage, uh, but the antigen tests tend to be a little bit less sensitive, meaning they're not gonna detect all the way down to the really low levels that the PCR does. So theoretically, you could miss some cases with the antigen test and give people a false sense of security, but those that are advocate for the antigen test say, well, we're gonna detect the people that are most infectious that have the highest virus levels, so that's why it's more important. Ideally, we would get to a situation where the antigen tests were cheap and available enough where we could just do one on ourselves every day before we went to work. Um, and that's possible, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so, you know, a, a little more work to do on that, um, but both of the things are, are available. There's an antigen test called the Binax Now, which was one of the earlier ones that was approved, and the government bought all of them up. And so that was kind of disappointing that nobody could uh, use those, but it turns out they're distributing them through the county public health, and we are expecting within a week or so to have those allocated to the clinics. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Ramers, for your insights and answers today. It's been great. Um, you'll be receiving an email yet today with the raffle prize winners and the survey link. We want to hear how you enjoyed the event. And then on Monday, you'll be receiving an email with a link to the recording of today's event so that you can review it or share it with friends. It'll also be up on our website. Thanks everybody for joining us. We especially wanna thank all of our sponsors for supporting the work of Family Health Centers of San Diego. We look forward to inviting you back in 2021, either here online or, or maybe over to Molly's. We'll have to see how things go. But regardless, have a great day, stay safe, keep your distance, wear your mask, wash your hands, and have a great holiday. Thanks everyone. Bye everyone.